All right, grab your Bibles, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I, I just want to sow a word into you this morning. That's my assignment. I will not preach the eternal gospel this morning. Uh, we will go, eat, take a nap, and then come back to the outpouring service, all right? Um, I will not take a nap, all right? How many take naps and don't wake up? Yeah, that's, I cannot take naps. All right. First Corinthians chapter 10. So we began a series a few weeks ago entitled Reset, Renew, Revive. I really felt the Lord say, we need to get ready to go into this new year. We got to reset some things. We talked about resetting our vision, resetting our expectation. Uh, and we got to renew some things. Last time I was with you two weeks ago, I talked about renewing the sacred enclosures, renewing our time with God, being in his presence. Uh, because that's what put those, puts those fences around our lives from things coming into our life that don't need to be there. Uh, this morning, I, we're calling this Renew Your Purpose. But really what I want to talk about is about the process. The process that God takes us through in order to bring us where he, he wants to bring us. Now, most of us live... What, we, what I call the land between the promise and the fulfillment, right? God puts something in your heart. God speaks to you. God gives you a vision. And then from, by the time it happens, there's a process in between, right? It's called the land of between the promise and the fulfillment. Now, the Apostle Paul said that, the, that what happened with the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, going through the wilderness, coming to the promised land was written as an example for us. Look with me, 1 Corinthians 10 Verse 6 says, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not just uh, not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as they were, as were some of them. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immoral immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the age has come. So like Israel in the wilderness, they were in the process of going from where they were in slavery for all those years, for 400 years, 
into a land that God promised them. Remember, he said to them, I'm going to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey, a land uh, you're going to walk into houses you did not build and lands that you didn't have to buy. You know, you get them for a dollar a year. You know, you're going to come into this land, this promise that I have for you. But I bet you the children of Israel probably were thinking at that point. Now, how many of you have ever gotten a promise from God and you just thought, man, it means tomorrow? It means like right now, this is going to be awesome. Um, we get so excited about the prophecy and forget that there's a pro- process after the prophecy. Right? How many of you have ever gotten a word from God and you got attacked in that very area? Right, again, it's the, it's the process. So the children of Israel are probably thinking, man, we're going to walk right out of Egypt, right after the border of Egypt. We're going to be in the border of Canaan. We're going to be in the promised land, not realizing that there was actually a land in between called the wilderness, that it was a 12-day journey between Egypt and Canaan. It was a 12-day journey. But how long did it take them? 40 years. 12-day journey became 40 years. Now, what determines the length of the journey is up to you. Yeah. It's up to you because of the process that God wants to take us through. If some of you are feeling right now that you've been in the process for 40 years, maybe it's because you haven't learned some things during the journey. All right, because no promise from God should take 40 years. Yeah. I know we, we spiritualize things. We're like, well, someday when I get to heaven, I'll see it. Well, no, if God promised it on the earth, you'll see it on the earth. And let's not over-spiritualize the length of our process sometimes. Sometimes, yes, it's, it's, it's an expiration time that God has on it. But other times it's because we haven't learned the lessons we need to learn. And we've actually prolonged our journey. So here's the first principle and I just felt there was a few things I need to give you this morning. Number one, there will always be enemies in the process. The process always has enemies. Right? When God gives you a promise, the devil doesn't say, we're excited. Let's go ahead and make way for you to walk into what God has for you. There's always enemies in the process. How many have realized that anything worthwhile that God has promised you, there was a fight? There was a journey. There were some things that had to change on the inside of you. There were some things you had to stand on and believe God. There was criticism you had to take. There was opposition you had to go through. Look at this, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you you go to possess and cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gerashites, the Ammonites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Bidenites, the Nusimites, seven nations... Great. Wait, is that not in there? I'm not being political. I'm just making it real. It says, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant. Say no covenant. No covenant. With them, nor show them mercy. Say no mercy. Nor shall you make marriages with them. Don't marry them. Don't make covenant with them. And don't have mercy on them. Now, when we read this, many times we think, well, the enemy means it's the devil. How many of you realize the devil cannot keep you out of what God's promised you? And he knows it. He in himself does not have the power to keep you out of the promise because he's a defeated foe. Says the, the Bible says that Jesus defeated him and made a show of him openly, right? But if he could get us to come into agreement with some enemies that are in the land, then he could keep us out. Actually, can you put all those on, on the screen, please, the names of the, the enemies? I actually did a study on this a few years ago, and all the enemies that were listed in there, isn't that amazing? The enemies that were listed in there, their actual names mean these things. It means fear, rejection, worthlessness, shame, insecurity, defilement, hopelessness. Those are the enemies that actually keep us out of the uh, promised land. And how many, you want, how many know the devil's going to make sure that these things come and try to have influence on your life to think that you're not worthy enough for the promise of God, that you know, there's too much shame, hopelessness, insecurity to try to keep you out of what God's promised you. 
But notice God said to them, he says, I want you to make no covenant with them, no marriage, and have no mercy. See, there's always enemies between your Egypt and your Canaan. Many of us want a miracle when God says, I don't want to just give you a miracle. I want to bring you into a new place. Let me repeat that. God doesn't just want to give you a miracle. He, want to, he wants to bring you into a new place. Right? A new place of residency or where you live or who you are. See, the reason God says to them, have no covenant, have no marriage, have no mercy, because to have a peace treaty is the declaration that you have no intention of leaving the wilderness. Is this on? All right. Because oh. when you make a peace treaty with those things that keep you out of God's best, you have no intention to leave the wilderness. How many know there's a lot of Christians who have bumper stickers and shirts that says, I'm going to the promised land, but their lifestyle says basically we're staying here in the wilderness. Their thinking says we're pretty much staying here in the wilderness. Right? We have to change our thinking. We have to change our mentality if we're going to go into the promised land. That's number two. The journey is more about you becoming bigger. The journey is not so much about the end product and what you're going to have and the promise and the blessing that God's going to bring in your life. I mean, you know, the, the journey, uh, the, you know, the bigger blessing is God making you bigger. The journey is about God making you bigger in the process. You know, there's a, there's, when, I, when I look back on my life, and it's not like I'm really old, but I have a few years in the ministry. I tell people, it's like, I look really young. I don't know if they, I do or not. I just tell people that. I said, I look really young, but I've, I have a whole lot of years because I started young in the ministry. Uh, when I look back on my life, you know, the promises that God made me were a great incentive for me to press forward. But when I look back at them from, from the other side, when I look back at them, the greater blessing was the process of what God did in me and not so much what I got. You hear me? But when we're going through the process, that's not so much. Because we're going through the pain, we're going through the struggle, we're going through believing, we're going through having to stand. But at the end of the day, when we look back at it, we're like, well, you know what? Even if the blessing wasn't there, but God, the process you took me through and what you did in me, I would not trade that for the world. You know, how many have ever gone through some really hurtful things in life? And at that moment, you were just asking God to relieve the pain. And, you know, why did I go through this? Why did somebody betray me? Why did this person leave me? Or, you know, whatever the situation was. But then years later, when God's done a work in you, you look back and say, not that I, I'm glad that happened to me, but thank you, Lord, for what you did in me in the process. You can't trade that for the world, what God has done in you. Come on, some of you are not convinced. Come on, Rippin, are you with me? Yeah, see, Rippin, they're loud right now. They are with me. The process is about you becoming bigger. That's the journey. When I first became the pastor here 23 years ago, when I became the senior pastor, the Lord gave me two promises. I'm going to read you one of them here in a moment. Um, at that moment, I was... Some of you were probably here. That I, I was freaked out. I was scared. Now, I was scared, one, because I was only 27, and I was going to become a pastor of this church that was around for 80-some-odd years, and, and there were some really mean people here, and it was, it was a tough church. And uh, just to give you an example, I was, I was at a um, uh, thing a couple of years ago called 1,000 Plus. It's where pastors of churches of 1,000 or more get together, felt, you know, talk, network, and learn. And uh, there was a pastor there who used to pastor in this area. He's in Nevada now. He sees me there. First, he's like, what are you doing here? Like, God's done something in Turlock that you would be here? And I'm like, yeah, I'm still in Turlock. He's like, wow. Then he tells his wife. He calls his wife over. He's like, hey, honey, you know where he pastors? And then he tells her the, what the name of the church used to be when I first came. He says, that's where he pastors. And then he looks at me and he goes, we used to call that church the Widowmaker. And I'm like, I don't have to be encouraged right now. 
But that's just kind of give you the idea of a tough situation that it was. So I remember coming in, and the, and the thing was, it wasn't like I was just coming in from the outside and thought, hey, this is great. They want me to be their pastor. No, I was the associate here for three years. I used to attend here before then. I knew where all the bodies were buried. I knew the skeletons. I knew what I was walking into. So that's why I was scared. I was freaking out. The Lord gave me two promises. I'm going to just read you one of them. Here's what God gave me. Exodus 23, 29. He says, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Back then, I thought that meant spiritual things. I didn't realize it also meant people. <laughs> I'll drive them out a little bit at a time. And, uh, but that was, it was a promise that God gave me. He says, I'm going to do this work in you a little bit at a time because I'm going to make you bigger so you could handle it. I'm going to make you bigger so you could handle it. You know, I tell people often, you know, for as not healthy as things were back then, I, you know, me back then could not handle the great stuff God is doing today because I wasn't big enough on the inside to carry what God has done in the house today. So the journey is more about you becoming bigger. See, we are often asking God to deliver us when God just wants to grow us and increase us. See, we have to have intentionality in the process. We have to be intentional in the wilderness. No one goes from Egypt to the promised land by being unintentional in the wilderness. We have to be intentional. Now, the first sign of having, see, now, by the way, you know, the children of Israel, they could not have gone into the promised land with a wilderness mentality. In fact, they could not even survive in the wilderness with an Egypt mentality. They were actually, they, they were, remember, they were in slavery for 400 years. So that means the generation that came out of Egypt, they, do not, they did not know what it meant not to be slaves. Their, their parents did not know what it meant to be, not to be slaves. Their grandparents did not know what it meant not to be slaves. And now God says, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, you realize if you take somebody out of slavery, you put them into a land, a, a, a house they did not build, a land they did not purchase, a land flowing with milk and honey, they will lose it if they don't know how to keep it. A slave mentality cannot inherit what it has not grown into. You all getting this? So we have to, God wants to grow who we are on the inside. So even in the wilderness, they still had a slave mentality. At the first sign of uh, attack, the first sign of difficulty, here's what they would say, hey, take us back to Egypt. Take us back to Egypt. See, they could not go into Canaan with a wilderness mentality. Number three, here's some mentalities of the wilderness. Okay, now there, there's, a, there's a lot of mentalities of the wilderness, but let me just give you a few that I felt I was supposed to give you today. Number one is the lack of faith in the face of opposition. That is a wilderness mentality, a lack of faith in the face of opposition. In other words, a wilderness mentality does not want conflict. Now, I feel like I, I, I got to qualify this. This does not give you excuse to go cause conflict with people. Amen. That's not the kind of conflict I'm talking about. Like, Pastor said, <laughs> I have a Canaan mentality. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this, is there's conflict that will, comes into your life as you're trying to get into the land where God has promised you. With the children of Israel, I mean, at any given moment, they're like, hey, take us back to Egypt. Like, look, look at this. Um, I'll skip that for sake of time. Number two, despising the manna. Despising the manna. A wilderness mentality. You know you have a wilderness mentality when you're not thankful for today's provision because you keep looking for what you want for tomorrow. That is a wilderness mentality. Some people call that, well, I'm just, you know, I just want more. No, you're just unthankful. And let me qualify that. I mean, we've got, we got to have vision for greater things in the future, but we have to know how to be thankful in the moment. Numbers 11 verse four out of the new living it says then the foreign rabble who, who were traveling with the Israelites 
Now notice it was, it was foreigners that were traveling with the Israelites that started complaining. They began to crave the good things of Egypt. So the foreign mindset, those who, who, who didn't know God. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Why? Because they were influenced by those who were complaining. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. Notice that they're talking about free fish when they weren't free. Who cares if you get free fish if you're not free? Oh, my. But, you know, a lot of people don't care. As long as they sign another $5 trillion bill to get more free stuff. No, you're just a slave then. To people who want to control you. Nothing's free. Somebody always paid for it. Okay, can I tell you one of my pet peeves? Here's my, one of my pet peeves. Um, I have a lot of them. But, here, but here's, here's, here's one. It's a sign of genius when you have a lot of pet peeves. But here, here's one of them. When Christians, okay, it's like we don't charge for almost all our conferences, right? I almost never charge. I get annoyed when I see people share it on social media and say stuff like, oh, you got to come and it's free. I'm like, it's free? Who paid for it? Your mama? <laughs> Nothing's ever free. Somebody paid for it. Somebody takes on the cost. If you are excited and you're trying to attract other people because something is free, it means you're a freeloader. All right, it's time to get bigger on the inside of inside and stop saying you're on your way to Canaan, but you're acting like a slave in Egypt. All right, I got that off my chest. All right. So despising the manna. So the foreigners, the foreign thinking, they were complaining. And then the children of Israel took on that same complaining. In other words, they, and one translation actually says it like this. It says, you know, it says, uh, I didn't finish the verse. It says, uh, we ate the free uh, fish in Egypt, and we had all the cucumbers, all the melons, all the leeks, all the onions, all the garlic we wanted. By the way, you know, that's not a good thing, and not if everybody's eating garlic. <laughs> it's like, right? That should be the rule in your house. If somebody's eating garlic, everybody's eating garlic. And if you eat garlic the night before church, don't come to church. Watch online. All right, so. <laughs> Watch verse 6. It says, but now our appetites are gone. All we have is this manna. One translation says, and, this, and we loathe this manna. What was manna? It literally means what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. It was supernatural. It showed up from God. Was it, was it God's best for them? No, because God promised them milk and honey. But in the process, God gave them manna, which was supernatural. Was it the end? Oh, no. Milk and honey was the promise. But manna was the transitional provision to the best. And they started loathing and complaining about God's supernatural provision. Have you ever thought that your manna is your testing ground for your milk and honey? If you cannot be thankful with manna, why should God give you milk and honey? Any good parent, when we, when we do it right, because we don't always do it right, when we do it right, we're going to reward our kids for thankfulness, not for what they don't have and complaining about what they don't have. Hey. Eh? Uh, despising the manna. Number three, complaining and murmuring. Complaining and murmuring. See, they showed their ungratefulness. But even more, they didn't get it. They didn't get what God was doing. They didn't get the process that God was taking them. You know what complaining does? It blinds us. We don't see the blessing. We don't see the process. We don't see what God is doing because complaining actually brings blindness to us. And number four, 
here's our wilderness mentality. We'd rather have religion than a relationship with God. We'd rather have religion than a relationship with God. Y'all, y'all remember Moses? He's up on a mountain meeting with God face to face. And uh, he's taking a little bit longer, right? Because anointed people take a little bit longer in service. I'm just trying to help myself here, right? So he's taking a little bit longer. He's not back yet. And the people are like, where's Moses? He's not back yet. I know what we'll do. Let's take all the gold and we'll make a golden calf and we'll worship it. How many think that's like really stupid? (laughs) It's like, who comes up with that? But I think we still come up with stuff like that. In other words, they were more comfortable with a form of faith that had no power in it than an actual relationship with a God that they cannot see, but he's very real. You know, when COVID hit in March of 2020, I I said something to our leaders. I said, God's going to reveal three things. He's going to reveal what's in us, what's reveal what's in the church, and we'll reveal what's in our nation. And I didn't realize how prophetic I was being. I thought this was 15 days, 30 days max. Didn't realize that we're going to go through this process of revealing Even though I said it, I didn't realize the depth of what I was saying. How many went through this last 20 months, especially in those beginning months? See, because you never know what's in you until something hits you. You never know what's in you until something squeezes you. How many started going through it and all of a sudden there was some stuff that started coming out in you that you didn't like? You're like, I didn't know this was in me. There was stuff in my life. I'm like, oh, wow. I thought I was doing better in this area. I don't think I am. There was stuff in the church I saw I did not like that came out after COVID hit. There were, there were some things that just weren't good that needed to move on. And then some things that came out, I thought, man, for 23 years, I thought I was teaching and preaching faith. All of a sudden, everybody's freaked out about the name of a beer. The coronavirus. <laughs> now listen, I'm not minimizing the virus. I'm not minimizing anything like that. It's real. People get sick. People have died. But we're not going to walk into the same fear, spirit of fear like the world walks in. I'm like, wait a minute. We've been preaching faith for 23 years. Now everybody forgot Psalm 91. No plague shall come nigh my dwelling. And all of a sudden, we're just freaked out about everything. I didn't like that. I didn't like, uh, could I just be honest with you? I will be anyway. Um, Doesn't it make you nervous when a pastor says, can I be honest with you? It's like, well, the rest of the time you weren't. (laughs) That's a delayed reaction. You guys are slow, but you're good. All right. I I began to see some of this stuff. I I started doing a real heart check. I'm like, I don't don't like this. I don't like this. We got to do better. I remember when we reopened, because we didn't stay closed very long. When we reopened, I remember telling our team, I said, we're not waiting for anybody to come back. This is our church now. We're building from here. It's the best thing we did. See, people wanted religion over relationship. And I think one of the things that this last 20 months has done, it showed why people came to church. See, prior to COVID, people came to church for all sorts of different reasons. Well, their homies were there. Their family went there. They saw their friends or it was just habit. And then after everything hit, and you didn't have to go to church anymore, you could just watch online which online is great. We have a great online campus. We really began to kind of see if we're moving back towards Egypt or if we're moving towards Canaan. You know, I I share these things with you already, you know, but the latest statistics is 10% of churches are bigger today than they were before COVID. And we're one of those. We're bigger now because half of you are new. (laughs) Right? We're, come on, how many have been here less than a year and a half? Let me see your hands. All right. Give yourself a hand. Come on. There you are. Awesome. Um, but those, 
here, here's what I've noticed. They don't say this in the statistics, but here's what I've noticed, and nobody has been able to show me otherwise. Those 10% that are bigger today than they were before COVID, every single one of them is a Holy Spirit, charismatic church, and is a church that's bold and stands for something. Right? They're not churches where the preachers are woke in the pulpit, but they're actually believing for an awakening. Right? For God to bring an awakening. Because people are looking for true north. People are looking for leadership. So Moses on the mountain, they're making a, you know, a, a, a sacred cow and want to worship it. The people were refusing to hear God for themselves and to receive from God. Instead, they just wanted a form of religion. Exodus 20, verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings, the flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar. Then Moses said, you speak, uh, then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, which was a lie. But let not God speak with us lest we die, which was another lie because if they were going to die, Moses would have already been dead. And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that, it, that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Notice this, when when others stood further away, Moses drew near. When we're in a time right now in the world, in our nation, where a whole lot of Christians have now begun to stand further away, come on, there's a people in this house that we're actually drawing near to God. Come on, come on, we're drawing near to the fire, near to the thunderings, rather than standing far. Come on, is there anybody in the house? When the world, say, I'm tired of Christians talking about how we're in a post-Christian world. Yeah. We're in a post-Christian America. The only reason if we're in a post-Christian America is because we've lost the anointing and the fire of God. Yeah. If you're trying to reach people with your wokeness, you'll never reach them. But, if you're tr but signs, wonders, miracles, and the presence of God cuts through every demonic philosophy that tries to keep people away from the kingdom of God. That's what we want. Come on. So that's what I like about Chi Alpha. They are a revival group. They are on the campus where it's philosophies and liberalism and all that, and they're not trying to argue with people with philosophies. They're bringing the power and the anointing of God. Didn't you guys have a blind eye open the other day on campus? They had a blind person whose eyes open on campus. Talk about getting an education, right? When others go further away, we're going to draw near. Exodus 33, 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. I want to be the friend of God. I don't want to have a cow that I say is God and I worship it. As a man speaks to his friend and he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. In other words, Joshua just loved the presence. He just hung out with the presence. Come on, worship team, come. He just, hung, he just hung out with the presence. Moses would meet with God, and then Moses would go and do his thing, and Joshua would be like, no, no, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. You know, Joshua, I don't believe Joshua did that because he thought, oh, I'm going to take over from Moses. This is the key. He just loved the presence. But I believe that's the reason Joshua became the leader after Moses instead of Caleb. Because Joshua lingered. Josh, we, we don't know how long he lingered. Could have been 10 minutes, could have been 15, could have been longer, I don't know. But that's not the point. See, we like to bring everything down to a formula. Well, how long do I have to linger in order to get my breakthrough? What's, how long do I have to linger for my promotion? You cannot reduce everything to a formula with God. It's a relationship. How long do I linger? As long as it takes. How long should I pray? As long as you need to. How long do we worship? As long as we want to and need to. 
I told uh, Josh, I said, you know, one of the first things we're going to do when we open up Hatch Road is we're going to have a worship night. Yeah. We're just going to go on just no other agenda. We're just going to worship all night. So you all better give if you ever want that open. Anyway, so I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. So because we don't want to be a people around a formula. See, most Christians think God rewards them because they perform well for him. If I do all the right things... God will reward me. God does not reward performance because performance becomes the work of, works of the flesh. I'm not, I don't want to say God rewards presence, but let me just say this. When you've been in his presence, his presence on you attracts what's of the kingdom. It's not like God says, I'll promote you because you've been hanging out with me because that becomes performance. But just because we've been with him, the kingdom draws near. Breakthroughs happen. The blessing of God happens upon our life. Our goal is not how much more could I do for God. It's I want to be in his presence. And by the way, you know, if, you, if you're in his presence, you will do whatever he asks you to do. I was praying this morning, I asked the Lord, I said, God, I, said, I was talking to the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, help me to love Jesus the way he deserves to be loved. Don't you feel like sometimes it's like you love Jesus, but you've just gotten busy with other stuff. You just got to take it up a notch. You just got to fall in love with him all over again. You just go back to your first love, Right? your first love, your foremost love, that he's everything. We don't want to be the kind of people that's, we're doing all this and we got Jesus. No, Jesus is everything, isn't he? Come on, anybody desire that for yourself too? Come on, stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that I'm going to have Pastor Alex come and close us. Remember what the Lord promised us. Get ready for the fire and get ready for the harvest. Say that with me. Get ready for the fire and get ready for the harvest. Come on, rip and say it with us too. Come on, all of us. Get ready for the fire and get ready for the harvest. How many want a fresh fire upon your life? Fresh fire. Some of you are, you know, you've been hanging on, doing good but you've lost the fire. You need the fire of God back on your life. Because remember, this series is called Reset. What's the next one? Revive. We're getting ready. We're going to come into 22, 2022 revived. <laughs> Experiencing the greatest revival we've ever experienced. I want to pray for you. Come on, just lift your hands. I want to ask the Lord to bring a fresh fire upon your life. Those of you in Ripon too, look on, lift your hands. Father, I ask right now, in the name of your son Jesus, who's the baptizer with the Holy Spirit and fire, I ask for the fire of the Holy Spirit to come now upon your people. Holy Spirit, now. Lord, as we go into 2022, Fresh fire, Lord, I pray. Fresh anointing upon your people. In the name of Jesus. Lord, a multi-site revival. Every campus, every service, experiencing the rivers of his presence and the fire of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Father, we come together as an agreement all across our campuses, all across those watching right now, for a fresh work, for a new day, because you're about to do a new thing. In Jesus' name. Come on, rip in your campus pastors are coming up right now to pray for you.